Good morning, everyone. Uh, so today, again, I'm coming to you from the light board room in the Jordan Science Hall. Uh, after the last time that I made one of these videos, it was suggested to me that I should uh, think about wearing some darker clothes rather than some bright shirt like this so that it would be easier to, to see the writing. And I was um, racking my brain trying to think, did I have any, do I have any black outfit? And uh, then last night it occurred to me in a flash of inspiration that, of course, like, like every professor, of course I have a black outfit. I have my, my doctoral robes. So uh, very fittingly, I will, uh, I'll see if this works. Okay, there we go. And uh, the fact that I'm wearing these should uh, automatically increase the quality of lecture by a factor of 10. Okay, so um, I want to, to talk about um, Turan's theorem and its extension to what's the largest number of edges that you can put into a graph and exclude or forbid the appearance of any particular subgraph. And the main theorem in this direction is the Erdős Stone Simonovitz theorem. And what the Erdős Stone Simonovitz theorem does is it basically completely answers the question of the largest number of edges that you can pack into a graph without having a particular subgraph appear. So um, you fix a graph F. If, uh, and as I talked about last time, I, I, I spent most of the last video lecture talking about the chromatic number. Uh, the answer to the question, what's the largest number of edges, is going to depend very much on the chromatic number of the graph F. So we'll dispense with the, the stupid case first. If chromatic number of F is 0, then that means F has no edges. And so you can pack in no edges. OK, let's, uh, so let's never think about that again. Uh, if the chromatic number of f is bigger than or equal to 2, then, OK, we, we were not going to be able to say exactly how many edges, but we're going to be able to say asymptotically how many edges. And specifically, the statement of the erdős stone simonovitz theorem is that if I take the limit as n goes to infinity of the largest number of edges that I can put into an n-vertex graph as a proportion of the total number of edges of the complete graph on invertices, so this is the proportion of, of edges that are actually present, then that limit as n goes to infinity is 1 minus 1 minus 1 over the chromatic number of f minus 1. So let's do a, uh, a quick example just to, to see that this is um, in the special case when f is the complete graph. This reduces to, to Turan's theorem. So if f is the complete graph on R vertices, then the chromatic number of f is R. And we know from Turan that the extremal number is exactly the number of edges in the Turan graph with R minus 1 parts on n vertices. We estimated that from above by saying that it's at most n squared over 2 times 1 over, or times 1 minus 1 over R minus 1. Uh, but we can equally well estimate this from below by saying, OK, I have n vertices. I break them into r minus 1 classes as equal as possible. That means that each of the classes is going to be at least the floor of n over r minus 1. And um, I'm going to, for each two classes, I'm going to have all possible edges between the two classes. So I'm going to have at least this many edges for each pair of classes. And how many pairs of classes do I have? R minus 1 choose 2. And uh, as n gets larger with R fixed, the floor or the integer part of n over R minus 1 gets closer and closer to n over R minus 1. So this is basically n squared over R minus 1 squared. This is R minus 1 times R minus 2. So one of the R minus 1s disappears. Here I have my n squared. Here I have my over 2. And here I have r minus 2 over r minus 1, which is exactly this guy. So from Turan's theorem, we get indeed that the limit as n goes to infinity of the extremal number of kr divided by n choose 2 
is 1 minus 1 over r minus 1. So um, Erdős Stone Simonovitz is the generalization of Turan's theorem to arbitrary f. Uh, the, the key point in the Erdős Stone Simonovitz theorem is a theorem that's due to the first two names on that list, Erdős and Stone. So um, just a little while after Turan proved his theorem, Erdős and Stone were considering uh, what happens if you take the number of edges, that is the largest number of edges that avoids a complete graph on R vertices, and you add in some more edges. Of course, because it's, you're starting with the largest number of edges that avoids KR, if you add in a few edges, you start getting copies of KR. Uh, but they suspected that you would actually start getting some very rich structures, not just single copies of KR here and there, but really some very, very, very rich structures. And uh, if you only added a few more edges beyond the threshold for having a single copy of KR, and to state the theorem that they were able to prove, let me, um, let me define uh, this object. So we know what KR is. It's the complete graph on R vertices. What is KR with the uh, parameter S? Well, I'll just define it in pictures. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take R blocks of size S. Uh, size s each, and I'm going to put all possible edges between all pairs of blocks, like so. So basically, uh, KRS is a Turan graph, a spe specific Turan graph under another name. It's the Turan graph with R parts and with a total of RS vertices. And the Erdős Stone theorem it says that. If you go a little bit beyond the threshold for having KR, then you actually get this huge structure, KRS. So the, uh, the theorem is that for all, let's say, uh, S bigger than or equal to 1, or bigger than or equal to 2, and epsilon strictly bigger than 0, there's going to be an n naught, an n naught is going to have to depend on all three of these guys, r, s, and epsilon, such that if n is bigger than or equal to n naught, and if g has n vertices, and at least n squared over 2 times 1 minus 1 over r minus 1, okay, if I stop there, then that would tell me that if I add one more edge, I will be guaranteed to get a copy of KR. So what I'm doing is I'm not going to add one more edge. I'm going to add epsilon n squared, or epsilon n squared over two more edges. So I'm just going to add a, I'm going to increase the proportion of present edges by a small factor. I'm going to add epsilon proportion of edges in. Uh, so if G has, has n vertices and it has this many edges, then you can find a copy of KRS inside in G as a subgraph. OK, so that's the, um, the, the Erdős Stone theorem. Uh, at the moment, I'm not going to give a, a proof of the Erdős Stone theorem. Um, it may not be the, the best use of, uh, of company time at this point in the semester. Um, I will almost certainly uh, write up some, some notes on the, on the, the proof of the, of the Erdős Stone theorem. But what I want to do now is I want to use Erdős Stone to deduce this fact here about um, arbitrary graphs f. OK, and for that, I need to clear myself some space. OK, so 
let's deduce the Erdős Stone Semenovitz theorem from the, the Erdős Stone theorem. Okay, so the first point is there's two points I'm going to make because um, the the e. Erdős Stone theorem says that the limit of uh, extremal nf over n choose 2 is equal to something. So I want to say that it's less than or equal to something, and it's bigger than or equal to the same something. So uh, if you give me an f with chromatic number at least 2, then the first thing I'm going to claim is that f, and let's say the chromatic number, so I don't have to keep writing chi of f all the time, the chromatic number is equal to or, well then, the first observation I'm going to make is that f cannot appear as a subgraph in the Turan graph that has only or minus one partition classes. And the reason for that is, is, uh, is pretty simple. So suppose I have the, the Turan graph here with um, or minus one blocks. And let's say that I can find a copy of f sitting inside this Turan graph, well, maybe there are some vertices of f in here, there are some vertices of f here, there are some here, there are some here, and this is what the, uh, the edges of f look like. So this blue picture here is f sitting inside um, the Turan graph with r minus eh. Uh, so this blue graph is 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 f sitting inside the uh, the Turan graph with um, r minus one classes, but notice that by coloring the vertices of f according to which of the classes they fall into, I get a proper r minus one coloring of f, and so in fact, this would imply that the chromatic number of f is at most r minus one, which is a contradiction. So the Turan graph with r minus 1 classes and n vertices is an example of a large graph, a graph with a large number of edges, that avoids having a copy of f. It doesn't just not have complete graph on r vertices. It, in fact, fails to have any graph which has chromatic number r or greater. And so that tells me something about the extremal number for excluding copies of f, it tells me something from below because it tells me, okay, I have at least have this many edges and can still, if I'm careful, avoid an appearance of f. So what that tells me is um, I want to say that the limit as n goes to infinity of the ratio is at least uh, the limit of the ratio of the number of edges in this guy divided by n choose 2, but I don't a priori know that the, that the limit exists. So I guess I have to be fancy and say um, that the, what it tells me is that the limit as n goes to infinity of the extremal number of f divided by n choose 2 is at least uh, the limit, and now I know this limit exists, so I can write limit, the limit as n goes to infinity of the number of edges in um, the Turan graph with r minus 1 classes divided by n choose 2, and that's exactly 1 minus 1 over r minus 1. OK, so I have uh, one direction by an explicit construction. Here is a large graph that avoids having any copy of, uh, of f sitting inside it. OK, what about the second direction? Well, the second direction is, uh, is going, to, going to be given to me by the, the Erdős Stone theorem. Uh, because the Erdős Stone theorem says that if I move just a little bit beyond uh, 1 minus 1 over r minus 1 proportion of, of edges, then not only do I get a copy of kr, but I actually get this, this huge structure. And it's pretty easy to see that if you give me any f which has chromatic number r, then I can embed f inside the structure as long as I choose the s to be large enough. Uh, the fancy thing to say would be, let me look at a proper R coloring of F and uh, look at the size of the largest color class. And that should be S, but I don't have to be that fancy. I'll just um, 
take s equal to the size of the vertex set of f. And if I do that, then I have that f is a subgraph of krs. Because, well, that, that's, let's look at this picture. Let's say again, my blue graph is f. And now I have r blocks. And this is my, um, uh, this is my coloring of, of f. So my partitioning of f into r blocks so that none of the edges go, go inside blocks. They all go between blocks. Um, none of these blocks has size any bigger than s. So I can just, I can just bump this picture up to a copy of, of krs just by making these, these blobs a little bit bigger. Um, so if I can, if, if I have a threshold so that if I have this many edges, then I'm sure to have a krs, then I'm also sure to have an f. And the Ernest Stone theorem tells me exactly, um, exactly when it is that I'm sure to have a, uh, a krs. So what Ernest Stone theorem says is that for all epsilon greater than 0, um, for all large n, if the number of edges of g is at least n squared over 2 times 1 minus 1 over r minus 1 plus epsilon, then we have a chain of transitivity because we have that krs is sitting inside in um, uh, in G as a subgraph, and we have that F is sitting inside in KRS. So of course, by transitivity, F is, is sitting inside G. And uh, that is going to give me some information about this ratio from above. And so the conclusion that uh, I'm going to get from the Erdős Stone theorem is about the limb soup. The limb soup, as n goes to infinity, of ex n f divided by n choose 2 is at most, well, I scale this number of edges by n choose 2, and the n squared over 2 divided by n choose 2 with the limit as n goes to infinity is 1. So what I'm left with is 1 minus 1 over r minus 1 plus epsilon. Uh, but that was valid for all epsilon. So this inequality here is valid for all epsilon bigger than 0. So what I have is that the limb inf is at least 1 minus 1 over r minus 1. And the limb soup is less than or equal to 1 minus 1 over r minus 1 plus epsilon for all epsilon bigger than or equal to 0. Uh, so the final conclusion I get is that the limit as n goes to infinity of ex n f over n choose 2 uh, that does exist and is equal to, as claimed, 1 over 1 minus 1 minus 1 over r minus 1. I keep saying that wrong. Um, so a little bit of history about this. Uh, why is this called the, the erdős stone Siminovitz theorem? Uh, well, the funny history is that Turan proved his theorem in 1941. Erdős and Stone observed this generalization in 1945, just four years after Turan proved his theorem. And one of the reasons why Erdős and Stone were, were thinking about this was that they were um, they were trying to understand the extremal number for excluding arbitrary subgraphs. Uh, so at least they were able to get this guy here, uh, but they seemed weren't able to go any further. And nearly 30 years later, I think it was in 1971, Simonovitz, the second S in Erdős Stone Simonovitz, looked back at the Erdős Stone theorem and realized, oh, wait a second, this does in fact completely answer the question for, for all F. So uh, it, was, uh, it was quite a gap between 1945 and 1971 when the answer was just sitting there, not in, in the literature, not in any particularly obscure journal. Um, 
And uh, it took a, a flash of inspiration from Miklos Simonovitz to, uh, to, uh, to realize that oh, the answer was just, just sitting there. OK. So as I say, I won't prove Erdős-Stone theorem. I'll, um, I'll give a reference to, to some notes on it. It's, uh, there's a lot of detailed analysis. There's some, some essential ideas that I might, um, in, in a lecture next week, uh, uh, talk through. But, but the details I'll, I'll put on the shelf for the moment. So I said this essentially answers the question of how many edges can you pack into a graph and avoid having a copy of some subgraph f. Uh, well, in certain cases, it more or less completely answers the question. Uh, suppose I'm thinking about a graph f which has chromatic number 3. Well, what the erdős stone siminovitz theorem tells me is that, OK, r is equal to 3, so 1 minus 1 over r minus 1 is a half. So that tells me that if I take a graph that has fewer than half of the potential edges, then there's a possibility that it doesn't contain my graph as a subgraph. But if I hop over that threshold from fewer than a proportion half to a proportion slightly bigger than a half, then certainly my graph f is going to appear. Uh, if my chromatic number is 4, then if I move from just below 3 quarters of the potential edges to just above 3 quarters of the potential edges, then I will go from the target graph maybe not appearing to the target graph certainly appearing. And you can play that game for any chromatic number bigger than or equal to 3. But what happens when the chromatic number is 2? When the chromatic number is 2, it turns out that the um, erdős stone siminovitz theorem uh, doesn't quite give you the sort of answer that you would like to get. So if the chromatic number of f is equal to 2, then here's what erdős stone siminovitz theorem says. It says that the limit as n goes to infinity of the extremal number of edges you can pack into a graph on n vertices and avoid having a copy of f, scaled by n choose 2, that limit is 1 minus 1 over 2 minus 1. 1 minus 1, 0. OK, what does that mean? That means that if I ask, what does this extremal function look like as a function of n, all it tells me is that this function is little o of n squared. So if you haven't seen this notation before, it's a very useful notation for comparing the order of magnitudes of functions. If I have two functions, f of n and g of n, then I'm going to say the function f is little o of the function g. Essentially, what it means is that the function f grows as n goes to infinity more slowly than the function g. And a way to formally say that is to say that the limit as n goes to infinity of f over g is equal to, to 0. So g is essentially a smaller growing, a, a less rapidly growing function than, than f is. So what this lim ratio limit being equal to 0 is saying is exactly that Whatever this function is, it's not roughly 10 times n squared, or 100 times n squared, or n squared over 100. It is something that is substantially smaller than n squared. Maybe it's constant times n. Maybe it's n log n. Maybe it's n to the power of 3 halves. There's a lot of room there for what that function exnf could be. If f has chromatic number greater than 2, then there isn't any room. Because saying that the limit is equal to, let's say when chromatic number is 3, saying that the limit is equal to a half, is telling you that the function basically grows like n squared times some constant. And if you really want to fine tune that, then you're talking about lower order terms in the growth rate of the function. But having this limit equals to 0, tells you that there's no dominant term. There's no constant times n squared term leading the charge. Everything is happening in this second error term. So 
Um, for, for graphs with chromatic number two, there's still a, a lot of room for, um, for, for different behaviors to occur. So I'm going to spend the next little while focusing on these graphs with, um, with chromatic number two. Let me, um, uh, because I, I, I want to move away now from chromatic number, I, I, I want to use uh, the more standard terminology for graphs which are chromatic number two. Let me give a, a definition that we've already seen when we talked about systems of disjoint representatives. Um, what do I mean by a graph being bipartite? Well, what I mean is that the vertex set of G can be partitioned into two classes, uh, not necessarily two non-empty classes. One of these might be empty. And the property of this partition is that if you have any edges of G, so if, let's say, x, y is an edge of G, then either x is in A, y is in B, or x is in B, y is in A. In other words, all of the edges go between the two partition classes. You have no edges inside. So this is exactly the, the setup we saw when we were talking about deducing Hall's system of disjoint representatives theorem from um, the Hall marriage theorem. Actually, this is exactly the setup for the Hall marriage theorem, too. So uh, bipartite graphs, uh, it's pretty clear, have chromatic number two. Because I can color everything in A with the first color, and I can color everything in B with the second color. Not quite true, because some bipartite graphs might actually have chromatic number one. If I can find a partition where A is empty, then I have the entire vertex set inside in a single class with no edges, and I can color with one color. The only situation where that occurs is if the graph has no edges. So, um, so that means that we can completely characterize in terms of biparticity. What does chromatic number equal to 2 mean? Chromatic number equal to 2 means that f has at least one edge. So its chromatic number is not 1, and f is bipartite. So for the next little while, I'm going to be thinking about uh, graphs which are bipartite. And I'm always going to, uh, even though I sometimes might not say it explicitly, I'm always going to assume that there's, there's at least one edge. Oh, sorry, quick pause to check that I'm, uh, my sound is still on. So for bipartite graphs, there is a lot of wiggle room for the value of this uh, extremal number, uh, because it's going to be some function of n that grows more slowly than n squared, but there's a whole continuum of such, such functions. So let's, uh, let's start doing some, some examples. So I want to, to talk through um, three, maybe, Maybe four examples. Uh, so the first is, uh, so the, the simplest examples of bipartite graphs are, are trees. Uh, if you think about a tree, it has no cycles, which means you can pick an arbitrary vertex, give it color one. Then you can go to its neighbors, give all of those color two. Then you can go to neighbors of the neighbors that haven't yet been colored and give those guys color one. And you can keep doing this until you cover the whole tree. And you'll never run, in, run into any problems, because running into a problem would mean that you would come to a vertex and you would try to assign it a color that clashes with a color that's previously be assigned to a neighbor. Uh, but that would mean that you have a cycle in the graph, because you have two different ways of seeing the same 
the vertex in this exploration process. So the, the simplest example of, of bipartite graphs are, uh, are trees. I want to say something about the, the Turan number, the, the extremal number for certain trees. So um, the, uh, uh, the first example that I'm going to work on is the star. So the star is the graph that looks like this. You have a single vertex that has a lot of neighbors, and there are no other edges. And uh, the parameterization I'm going to give of the star is I'm going to work with stars which have k plus 1 vertices. And well, we've already talked about a long time ago the number of edges in a tree. Uh, the number of edges in a tree is 1 less than the number of vertices. So if I have k plus 1 vertices, then I'm going to have k edges. So I'm going to give uh, this guy a name. I am going to call this graph S k plus 1. So S k plus 1 is the star on k edges or k plus 1 vertices. And I am, uh, I'm going to try and figure out what is the, um, the, the Turan number of the star. Uh, well, what is the star? The star is just a vertex that has high degree. So really what I'm asking is, when I'm asking about the extremal number of the star on k edges with um, uh, n vertices, I'm asking, how many edges can you pack into a graph while avoiding having a vertex, a single vertex that has degree k or greater, k edges, so degree k or greater. And it turns out that you can pack in, by example, linearly many edges, but you can't pack in anything more than linearly many edges. So the right scaling for the limit as n goes to infinity of, um, of the extremal number is to scale it by n. And when you scale it by n, you get the answer k minus 1 over 2. And the proof here is going to be on the next homework. OK, so, uh, so that was an easy example because uh, you're going to do all the work for it. Um, the second example I want to do is another very simple example of a tree. So one example of a tree is uh, you, you start off with a root and you just spring out in all directions spring out in all directions and then stop. Uh, another example of a tree, a graph with no cycles, is that you start at a vertex, you move to the next vertex, you move to the next, you move to the next, etc., and you just, just travel along a path. So the path graph is just a collection of vertices that are somehow linearly ordered, and you have an edge between the, the, the lth vertex and the lth plus 1 vertex as L runs from from, I guess, 0 up to k, because I'm going to be thinking about, again, uh, my parameterization is going to be the number of vertices is k plus 1. And so the number of edges is going to be k. And I'm going to denote this by, um, by pk plus 1. So always the subscript on a tree is going to indicate the number of vertices the tree has. So if it's k plus 1, it's going to have a total of k edges. So the question we're going to ask is, uh, how many edges can you put into a graph on n vertices and avoid having a path of k edges sitting inside the graph as a subgraph? And the claim I'm going to make is that the limit as n goes to infinity of the extremal number of the path on k edges is again, it's a linear quantity. If I scale by n, then in the limit as n goes to infinity, ah, again, I get the same quantity, k minus 1 over 2. OK, this one I'm not going to leave as an exercise. This one I'm going to attempt to, uh, to give a proof of. So there's going to be two, two halves to the proof. 
The first half is that I'm going to have to give you a construction of a graph that has roughly k minus 1 over 2 times n edges and that doesn't have a path on k edges in it. And then the second half of the proof is I'm going to show you that if I add even a few more edges to that number of edges, not to that example, but to that number of edges, then I can't avoid getting the path. Uh, the example of a graph that avoids having a path is actually pretty simple. Well, at least when k divides n, it's extremely simple. So suppose k divides n. Consider G a union of k sub k's. So in other words, I take a graph which is made up of a bunch of blocks, n over k of them in all, and each block is a complete graph on k vertices. So I guess I'm doing k equals 4 in this particular picture. Um, the only way I can find a path inside in this graph is inside in a single component, but each component has only k vertices, and my path has k plus 1 vertices, so clearly pk plus 1 is not contained inside in G. And um, how many edges does G have? Well, the number of edges of G is there are a total of n over k copies of this complete graph, and each one has k times k minus 1 over 2 edges. And so what I get is exactly n times k minus 1 over 2. So that automatically tells me that the, the lim inf as n goes to infinity of exn pk plus 1 over n is at least k minus 1 over 2. OK. Uh, that's all under the supposition that uh, k divides n. And it's going to be uh, part of the, the next homework, or maybe the quiz that's due on Monday, to deal with other k. So something very, very much like this is going to work for, for arbitrary k. You just have to be a, a tiny bit more careful. OK, what about the other direction? So in the other direction, um, for the star, you'll see when you, when you, when you try to think about this, it, it turns out to be really simple. But for the, the path, it, it actually ends up being uh, a quite involved proof, which hopefully I'll be able to, to get through in the, um, in the next 15 minutes. Um, what I want to show is, OK, suppose that the number of edges in G is strictly bigger than n k minus 1 over 2. Well, what I want to conclude is that the graph is going to have a path on k edges sitting inside it. And if I can show that, then that will tell me that the limb soup of the extremal number divided by n is at most k minus 1 over 2. And that will give me the, um, that will give me the, the claim over here. Um, so, so what we're going to work towards is we want to find pk plus 1 in G. Now, what do I tell you if I tell you the graph has many edges? I tell you that the average degree is fairly high. So for this graph, the average degree of G is, what is it? It's bigger than, well, um, the sum of the degrees is twice the number of edges, which is n times k minus 1. So the average degree is bigger than k minus 1. And, and that's sort of nice because that says that uh, if I start with a vertex, then typically it will have high degree, so I can move to a new vertex. And typically that vertex will have high degree, so I can move to a new vertex, and I'm building up a path iteratively. Uh, but the problem is just saying that the average degree is high is useless because there might be some vertices of low degree and I might accidentally run into one of these vertices of low degree as I iteratively construct the path. 
Um, what I would like to be able to do is assume not just that the average degree is high, but actually that all degrees are high. And there's a nice trick that I can do that's going to take this graph G, it's going to turn it into maybe a slightly smaller graph, but still a relatively uh, large graph, which has the property that all of the degrees are still, uh, sorry, that, that has the property that the average degree is still large, but now also all of the degrees are, are pretty large. And basically, this is going to be an iterative process of removing edges, of removing vertices which have low degree. And I'm just going to keep removing vertices which have low degree until there are no vertices of low degree left. And then I'm going to, um, I'm going to see, well, see what's left. Um, so from G, keep removing vertices of degree less than or equal to. Well, it turns out what I can get away with is I, I'm going to be able to push the minimum degree up to k minus 1 over 2. I won't be able to get all the way up to k minus 1, but I'll be able to get halfway there while still maintaining the average degree. OK, so keep removing vertices of degree less than or equal to k minus 2 uh, until no longer possible. And what I get is a graph g prime on n prime vertices with minimum degree. Actually, I, I don't want it, the minimum degree to be at least. I want the minimum degree to be strictly bigger than k minus 1 over 2. Um, because why? Because I have I, every time I see a vertex which doesn't have degree bigger than k minus 1 over 2, I remove it. Uh, there's a, a slight problem here, which is I might have just removed the entire graph. This g prime might actually be uh, an empty graph. And so the statement that all vertices have degree bigger than k minus 1 over 2 might be a completely vacuous statement. So uh, let's, let's see, could it be possible that this graph has, um, is empty? So how many edges does g prime have? Well, let's see. I started with at least n, with strictly more than n k minus 1 over 2. So the answer is that it has strictly more than n k minus 1 over 2 minus the number of edges that I deleted. Now, how many edges did I delete it? Well, I have n prime vertices left at the end which means I deleted n minus n prime vertices. And each time I deleted a vertex, I deleted at most k minus 1 over 2 edges. And notice that the n k minus 1 over 2 and the n k minus 1 over 2 cancel. So what I'm left with is n prime k minus 1 over 2. OK, the number of edges that I have left is strictly bigger than this number, but this number is certainly bigger than or equal to 0. So the number of edges I have left is strictly bigger than 0. So the size of E of G is strictly bigger than 0. And that in particular means that n prime can't actually be, um, uh, um, hmm. Hold on one second. <laughs> 